Good evening to everyone and uh, I'm really happy that you join us uh, today and I'm really honored to welcome here with me uh, Salvatore Girardo. Um, he is a physicist with expertise in microfabrication technologies, particularly in the field of microfluidics for applications in biology and biophysics. So since 2019, he has served as the head of the lab on a chip system technology platform at the Max Planck Institute for the Science of Light in Erlangen in Germany. In this role, he focuses on the development of smart materials and microfluidic technologies, primarily within the field of mechanobiology. And in, in his research team, they have developed microparticles that mimic the physical characteristics of cells. So scientists have been studying chemical properties of the cells for a very, very long time. But one of the exciting discoveries uh, in bi biophysics was that physical properties of the cells also uh, matter and can give us an insight into disease mechanisms. So Salvatore, can you give us a short insight into what happens with the cells during our lifetime and what what can this tell us about the state or health of our organism? Yeah, first of all, thanks a lot, really, for the nice introduction. And you really give also a nice introduction of the topic uh, of today. And I want to trigger, let's say, your curiosity uh, with the first slide. And here you can see like a video that is showing the crucial steps of uh, at the beginning of life. So there is an organism that is developing, uh, and here in this video, you can see one cells to 100 cells. So now, if I will ask the biologist to tell me what is going on, probably will start telling me, okay, you know, like cells are complex machinery. They are using, let's say, the information that are encoded in their the DNA, and they are using this information uh, to, let's say, accomplish specific tasks. But now, let's say that we don't know anything about biology, okay? And I will tell to everyone, look at this video, what you will say. So what you will see that cells are changing. And what is changing? So from the first analysis, I will say, okay, size, shape is changing. Cells are getting deformed. And because they're getting deformed, there are like forces acting between them. So now that they say there is a paradigm. So we will have like a cause that is the molecular part. So we know that cells use like uh, their DNA to do specific function, but then uh, this will uh, generate like a different appearance of cells. So cells can be like different uh, in all their physical properties. Then uh, here, I want to show you today, I'll tell you the three like, uh, as already Lea uh, said, that physical properties of cells uh, matters. So, to show you this, probably I can show you a, a simple, this is a really super simple example. So if you go to a doctor and you say that I'm not feeling good. So probably the first things that he will tell you is, okay, let's do a blood check. So they will analyze your blood. So they take the blood, they can have a look under microscope. And if you have a look of your blood under microscope, you can have already like analysis of different physical properties of cell, like cell type, cell number, cell shape, cell size. And all these parameters can be used as a marker for diagnostic. So what does it mean? So in your report, you will get a value and then close to a value, you will have a, like a range of values. So if the value you have is within this range, you say, okay, everything is fine. Is it, if is it out of range means that probably something is not really correct. And the doctor will say, okay, probably we need to do more investigation. So this is just to tell you that variation of cell physical properties can be associated to pathological changes in cells. And this is already used, okay? So now I want to give you also like a more insight into this and you can see, for example, if you get standard red blood cells, they have a discodal shape, they have a specific size uh, and any variation in shape or let's say in size, sorry, or shape, this can be associated with a pathological condition. So now you will ask me, so which pathological condition? We don't know. So we will have just some hints and probably the doctor will, will go to further investigation. But you need to imagine that taking your blood analysis is really not invasive, easy. And this can allow like to have really like a first screening uh, for further in uh, investigation and get the first hints. So now probably something that you are not familiar with 
that between all the physical properties of cells, there is another physical properties that is cell mechanical properties of cells that also matters. So what are cell, what are mechanical properties of the cells and why haven't they been studied before? If I understand correctly, this is yeah. something new. Yeah, so it was, I mean, the, I will describe you the concept and all, also there are, um, so it's not, they're not using, use in routine check. And we want to bring this and show that probably in the future, this will be used in routine check. But first, what is a mechanical property is, is that a simple parameters that tell you how much a cell can deform. So you can apply force. So you have like, say, a spherical object, you apply force, and then now uh, you have some mathematical model that, that connect this force with the deformation. And this is related then now uh, with the parameters. They tell you how much, let's say, an object, in our case, a cell, uh, is like able to deform if a cell is stiff or if a cell is soft. So in science, we use these parameters to measure the elasticity of a cell. It's called Young's modulus. If this is higher, will be stiff. If it's lower, will be uh, soft. So now to explain you and, and uh, what does it mean doing a mechanical test, I want to show you like some uh, an example of daily life. So you perform a mechanical test when you go to the supermarket and buy a tomato. So the first things that you will do is to grab the tomato and say, okay, is this tomato uh, stiff or soft? And then uh, based on this, you will uh, do your analysis and decide if it's good or not, okay? And also there is another thing that is really like palpation, for example, is a common practice used by doctors for general diagnostic. And this is the first strategy, for example, to detect breast cancer. So, you know, in this case, we are, we are like using our like sense of touch and using in daily life and using this also like for diagnostic. Okay, so th this is clear. Our senses allow us to perceive through touch, for example, various properties of what we touch, including stiffness and so on. But how can scientists sense the stiffness of cells given that we you can't exactly touch the cells with your bare hands so how can you enable sense of touch in the cells yeah this is the challenge so now we have a cell a cell is like 10 micron you can need to imagine 10 micron is like 10 times smaller than the diameter of a hair how we can touch the cells and this is something that we cannot do like i showed you before if we just now Look at your blood. Is everything static, not moving? We cannot touch the cell. But what we have developed, and this is a technology that's been developed in our institute, uh, is to use like uh, a micro 3D chip. So what is this chip? So this chip is like uh, made of uh, really small channels that are size comparable to cells. And then now we use also microscopy methods, again, a microscope, but a more complicated microscope uh, with say fast microscope, they can acquire like thousands of images in a second, okay? So now our chip can be, we can load the samples, we can activate the flow by using other complex uh, instruments. And what you will get, you can see here, for example, that your cell, that is more or less like a spherical object, so they will enter this channel and by the force that are activated by the flow, they will get deformed. You will see here a spherical and there they get this bullet-like shape, okay? So, so now the thing is that they are deformed and if we look how much like are deformed, we can measure the deformability. So you can see here our device that is operating in real time. So what we can do now, is not only like deforming a cell in a small channel that has a size comparable to a cell, but measure cells at thousand cells per second. And now by using these methods, we are able to measure millions of cells in a measurement. And this is really striking. Okay, so this is a completely new technology. It can measure a lot of cells uh, as, we could, as we can see, uh, which is great. But why? Why? What is the main benefit of this technology and how different uh, or how advanced it is compared to technologies that are already that already exist? Yeah. So let's say I would like to show in these slides now there is like 50 years of technology development in measure 
being mechanical properties of cells. So as I told you, the concept is easy. You apply a force and you measure the formation. Now, how we can apply a force? At the beginning, this was like 50 years ago. Science, they say, okay, we can take a pipette, put close to the cell, and then pull, okay? So we apply force by pulling, and then we measure how much is the forming here in this region. So then uh, there is another technology. Say, okay, we can use a FM. In this case, it's a small cantilever pressing on the cell, and then uh, again measuring how much is the forming. Or even you can use light. You can use light to stretch a cell. And more recently, and this is what we have developed at our institute, is to deform cells in flow by using this uh, small microfluidic device. So now you can see here. In these 50 years of development, we move from 10 cells per hour. So you can measure 10 cells per hour, and now we have 1,000 cells per second. So what does this mean? We are like 360 times faster, OK? And this is really important at some point also, first, because we want to pick up heterogeneity of the sample, and second, because we want to translate at some point this technology also to a real application. Could you uh, explain me a little bit more why is it important to, to have that many cells? I mean, what are advantages of this technology for someone who is not coming from this field? Yeah, I mean, this is a picture, for example, showing uh, all the cells that you have in your blood and then we measure in our channels, okay? And from this picture, you can see that Blood cells, for example, this is a blood sample, is completely heterogeneous samples. What does it mean? You will have completely different cell types inside, okay? And also as a general practice, as a scientist, as a physicist, uh, when you want to measure parameters, uh, it's really important uh, to have like, uh, you cannot just give a value. You need to have like, uh, give a value and also range within this value can be, can vary. I can give you a, a simple example. Let's say that you buy a foil uh, package and I ask you, what is the thickness of a foil? You will take uh, your light ruler, you measure one, and then you will say it's one millimeter. And then I will tell you, are you sure that is one millimeter? Then you will measure all the 500. And then you will say, okay, someone is 1.2, someone is 0 0.8. Okay, so then uh, the real measurement, you say, okay, one millimeter is the mean value and our light value is changing between 0 0.8 and 1.2. So this is really relevant now when you measure like life matter, something that is continuously changing. Uh, and there you need to provide not a value, but a range of parameter. Okay. Also when uh, you want to understand if this parameter can be correlated with specific, uh, let's say, uh, disease. And this is what we can do now uh, with our technique. So we can measure how we measure this. And also like it's important now, let's say, uh, I record all these images, and then you will tell me, but what does it mean? If I go to a doctor and I show this image, okay, hematologist will say, cool, I can see a cell that is strange, uh, blah, blah, blah. But I need to provide some a way to show like all my analysis uh, in an understandable way. And for science to do this is that now to transfer this uh, to data. So how we transfer this to data, we have an image, we can detect the contour of a cell, and by detecting this contour, we can measure the parameters. So what is a parameter in our case is a deformation. This is telling us how much, like an object, is like varying compared to a spherical object, okay? So now, by doing our measurements, if I get 10 microliters of your blood and we run in our system, this is a fingerprint of your blood. So these are the data that we extract. And you can see, for example, here, there are like erythrocytes that are red blood cells. And here you have like uh, white blood cells and different type of black, white blood cells. And this is really important also why we need to measure a lot, because if we want to measure blood that is heterogeneous, okay? So in blood, we will have some, uh, let's say, cells that are more abundant and the other ones that are less. So for example, white blood cells represent 0.1% of the total numbers of cells that you have in your blood. This means that if I measure 1,000 cells, probably I will get one white blood cells. And now I can base my results just on one measurement? No, no way, I cannot. So then now I need to measure 1,000 white blood cells. And this is telling you why we need to measure millions. And we need to measure millions in a reasonable time. Like in our case, we'd be 10 minutes. 
before to measure millions 50 years ago will take 10 years, okay? Not pra practically will be not possible. And now you can understand how this can really, this technology can really probably translate and, and be used probably in medicine. This is our goal currently in our institute also. Mm -hmm, great. Uh, but can uh, what can this data tell us? Can this be used to, for example, identify pathological situations? Can we understand if there is, for example, a, dis a disease behind all, all of this? Yeah, it's possible. I mean, now when we measure, I told you, we identify a fingerprint, like of an healthy patient. And then we, from this fingerprint, how this data are distributed, this change can tell us that something is happening. And for example, here you can see like uh, the scatter plot of red blood cells for an healthy patient and a patient that was affected by COVID-19, okay? And you can clearly see that the pattern is changing. So now I don't want to tell you that, you know, that we will be, if I would not know that this, like say patient that will have COVID-19, uh, I cannot tell, okay, you have COVID-19. But I will tell, okay, look, there is something strange in your blood. Please go to a doctor and see what is wrong. So this is just an hint again, every time we measure, that can an hint for an unhealthy. So say, okay, this patient is unhealthy. And this can trigger like further investigation. But one important thing is that now if I look at this person that was sick later, when he recover, I will see that the let's say how the data are populated is compared to the healthy condition. And this is telling us now that we have a technology absolutely that can help us to see, to monitor. For example, if we develop specific treatment, okay, and we want to see if the treatment is working or not, this is something that we can do because we have like, uh, we know how the scatter is when there is an healthy and we can monitor the variation of these parameters in a certain range uh, why the treatment uh, is applied. So currently, so there is a lot of interest in using this technology and there are like uh, several projects also to investigate long COVID because there are like people that are still affected. So after they got COVID, they still see pill fatigue, they have problem uh, and doesn't exist, let's say, in methods that can be used to uh, tell to a person uh, that is affected by this disease. And this is a big problem. You can understand because sometimes you go to doctors and say fatigue, blah, blah. And then at some point you say, because we cannot identify something, okay, you have some mental problem. So this is the, the end. So uh, this is like, it's really important to identify like also new methods to diagnostic new uh, pathologies. But this is like uh, really like hard. You can imagine like hard is to really identify specific variation and say in our case in physical properties. Now I'll show you Two, but out of our measurement, we can take out more than 20. And the idea is that we can, at some point, we'll be able to identify specific pattern that can be associated to say, okay, prob most probably, so you are like affected by uh, long COVID. Great. So your new technology could also help us uh, figure out uh, long COVID, what it is and how can we finally treat it. Uh, but where in practice, for example, can your technology be be useful and uh, how, who could be, for example, the end user and how far are you to put this technology on the market? So it's a good question. You know, we have uh, like founded a company it was almost one, one and a half years ago. So we have launched our first, let's say, instruments on the market. And we will have already like uh, we deliver two of these instruments before the end of the year. They are still used. This will be still used in research center. And our goal to go is to go to what we call in vitro diagnostic, so to have a really like a system that can be used uh, for specific disease. And but this is still uh, like the science part. And, but at some point when we have an instrument that is ready, and then uh, we have a clear way to analyze, then probably. We have in our hand also like a new tool that doctors can use, for example, to detect long COVID or other immune disease. How how many years away are we from that? What from, would 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 your guess? Oh, be? I mean, it's not years, and we already have like good 
preliminary results. I can tell you, like, we develop prototypes not before <laughs> reaching a good instrument. And 10 of them were already like used uh, in uh, like reserve center and, and medical facility where we have like billions of data already like collected on patients uh, currently that were affected by long COVID. And currently the challenge is to analyze all this data. And there are like also like a lot of data scientists working on this using artificial intelligence to try to really identify, let's say a unique uh, parameters or a comprehensive like uh, um, parameters that can be used for this. So, and probably let's see in one year, we'll see uh, something coming out of this. Mm -hmm. Probably less. Mm -hmm. But this uh, cell mechanics measurements are still not that widespread in biology and medicine. So what are some of the obstacles or challenges this style yeah. and still needs to address to enable uh, it to be more widespread? Yeah, I can tell you, like, in this case, as a company, one of the big challenges was uh, we want an instrument that is easy to use. And we work to make this as much easier as possible and reliable as possible. But there is another important thing uh, is that also when you talk with doctors and say, OK, I'm measuring something, but I can trust what I'm measuring. You know, if I want to do a diagnostic, uh, I want to be sure that my results are, like, uh, reliable. So we want to have, like, uh, an instrument that is always, when he measuring, uh, is really precise and accurate. And in general, uh, how, how you measure like precision and accuracy of your instruments, you need a standard. So, for example, let's say if you want to measure if your balance is working, you take one kilo. You say this is one kilo. I put on my balance. If gave you the right value, means that is working. So now we need to develop again because it doesn't exist a standard uh, for something that needs to deform in a small channels. So how we can do this? So we will need then, uh, let's say, some particles that are soft enough that can be deformed. And they have size comparable, to, uh, let's say, to cells. I told you 10 micron, pretty small, 10 times smaller than uh, her. And now the question is that how we can you know how we can make them. So the, this was the, let's say, the big challenge now. So not only like. Uh, thinking how they should be, but also like how to translate this to reality. And before going and show you how we can, let's say, make them, I want to show that this can be really used in our system uh, as a mechanical standard. And here are like, let's say our bits that are mixed with the wall blood. So, and then they're like, like flow together with the blood. And now you can see this is like, our data that populate. So now we left two fingerprints. One is for the blood and one uh, is for our beats. So what is the difference? That this fingerprint of beats cannot change. Every time we measure, we need to see the standardization region populated by the measurements done on our beats. Why the rest can change? So, and this is a way, let's say, to standardize a measurement. So now you can mix them and the doctor will be sure that when it's measuring, uh, this is not affected by, I don't know, any problems of the instruments or because the user is doing something wrong. And uh, if I understand correctly, these beads are really, really small spherical shape droplets or how would you, how would you put it? Uh, can you explain us how they look like, what are they and how, how do you produce the, them and control their proper properties? Yeah, uh, I mean, I can give you like this simple example. So let's say we can take two immiscible liquids. So we have oil and water. Okay, how can I mix them? They are immiscible. Okay, I can just take this and shake. I shake, what happens? When I shake, I have now droplets of water in oil. This is called emulsion, okay? So now if I wait a few minutes, what will happen? They will separate again. So, but what we can do now is to keep these droplets there and to have, let's say, stable emulsion. So what we will do is to add to the oil, it's called emulsifier. So we have this emulsifier, now these droplets is a molecules that will go around the droplets and will prevent these droplets to merge. Okay, so now we have droplets, but droplets are liquid. So we need something that is soft and deformable. 
So how we can do this? What we can do is that to just use water is to mix the water as specific compounds that make out like an hydrogen. So what is an hydrogen is a gel-like material that is able to hold water inside. You can see here is like meshwork of chain inside within this meshwork of chain, we have the, the water. So now you can see if we just do this by shaking uh, and uh, we can uh, get these particles, soft particles, but they are too big. They are really like uh, different in size uh, and we don't know. Also the, the, let's say their ability to deform will change. So how we can do them really like, as you asked me now, now really controlled. So again, we can use like a microfluidic chip. So what we can do is to flow, we generalize this chip in a way that we can flow now these two liquids that I, I told you before. And by doing this now, we can have small drip, like dripping of these like small droplets uh, of the, let's say, uh, hydrogen solution inside the oil. So this is like a small dispenser, dispensing a droplet one by one. And you need to imagine that this droplet has a volume of about one, let's say 10 femtoliters. What does it, this means that if you take like from a fingerprint, so a drop of blood is about 10 microliter, this will be 1 billion smaller volume than a drop of blood. And why do this? Also, we can produce them pretty fast. So you can see here, we are doing like 60,000 beats per second. Why? Making them all the same. So having a really good control on their size and also on the chemistry that you have inside that later will generate our, let's say, other gen beats. Mm -hmm. So if I understand correctly, by using this micro fluidic chip and with well-defined channels and flow rates of this uh, fluid, you can produce droplets. And then these droplets, with the help of chemical reaction, polymerize into these chemically engineered hydrogel beads. Exactly. Okay. Okay. And what are the properties of these microgel particles? Do they also have some kind of biomechanical properties and can react with cells? or are they only used um, hmm. uh, as a standard? Yeah, so what I show you here is that we can produce them as a standard, no? Uh, what does it mean as a standard? We produce them, we characterize, we can have a specific identity card of these bits. We can control the diameter and the Young's models that tell us how stiff they are. But on top of this, we can also like add more functionality, like sensing, of these beads, they will be able to sense force. How we can do this? We can add, let's say, specific molecules that make these beads fluorescent. You can see here in green. And also some proteins that will be like going uh, around these like beads. You can see these red parts. So now if we put these beads together, let's say with cells, cells can uh, adhere on the beads and can deform the beads, okay? So in this way, now we can have like a sort of way to measure forces based on how much the beads deform. To explain you, I probably can give you like a better example because you say we can look at deformation to measure forces. So what we are doing is that indirect measurement. It's like if you have a spring, you know the properties of your spring. When you load like weights, this spring can elongate and depending on the weight can elongate different. So then you have a specific like physical equation that correlates how much the spring is elongating based on the properties of the spring that you know. And from this, you can calculate force. So what, what does it mean? I look how much the spring elongates and then I measure force. The same can be done on our beads. So I told you our beads are like standardized. So we know they're like mechanical properties, the Young's modulus. We can measure the deformation. And then now using like a mathematical equation, we can calculate the force. So now I want to show you that how this is working in reality. So you can see here our beads injected in a zebrafish embryo in a lab. And these are like injected in a tissue of the zebrafish. And you can see here now when I start playing the video that our beads are like deforming, changing shape. 
So then we can use complex mathematical model to extract all the forces that are like acting on our beads. But this is a unique way now to quantify forces in tissue just by using beads deformation. And this was not something that was possible before at this like cell scale. So now, and if we can measure this, again, we have the parameters and we can try to correlate these parameters with healthy physiological and pathological changes in uh, tissue. So, and uh, yeah. And how important is this information about force? I mean, what can, can it tell us? So, I mean, as I told you before, um, cells interact with their environment. And also like, uh, let's say, I show you in the first video that an organism builds up from cells. And also like putting more cells together, create tissue and cells are embedded in tissues. So also the mechanical properties of, of tissue can affect, let's say the genetic profile and how a cell behave, okay? Let's say, for example, if we have an in, inflamed tissue, so we know that this tissue can get stiffer and this can create problem. So now you can see, for example, in this like video, you can imagine a tissue like uh, a meshwork, 3D meshwork with some porosity. So if this, is, this porosity starts to be smaller and stiffer, this can be also a problem for your drugs to diffuse and reach, let's say, the site that you want to reach. For example, also this, this is now like shown that for cancer tissue, also these are like much stiffer. I show you also an image before where the doctor was using palpation. And, you know, by using palpation, you can see, okay, I feel something that is not soft as normal, it's stiffer. And this is now a way that we can really like monitor this, like again, these parameters. And if we have the parameters, then if we have a treatment, we can see if something is changing. Okay, thank you. So um, here on the picture, uh, on the video is the real tissue of a real organism. But now yeah. you are trying to, to combine these tiny hydrogel beads that act as sensors also with a lab model, right? I'm talking about a Flamingo project you're doing this as part uh, uh, as a as a as part of Flamingo project, uh, whose aim is to personalize the treatments uh, for rheum rheumatoid arthritis, a long term autoimmune disease that causes pain, swelling, and stiffness in the joints, and for which there is no definite definite cure at the moment. And the main technical goal of this project is to develop an organ on chip, which is a very small culture unit that could be used to test whether and how a patient will respond to a specific drug before the drug is actually given to him, which means that scientists, you scientists are trying to make in a way a twin of the patient's joint on a chip and mimic what is happening in the joint of that patient. And can you tell us, can you explain us what is your role and the role of your innovative technology in the Flamingo project? And what will your micro beats that at act like microsensors measure, for example, in the project? Yeah, I mean, you give really good explanation of the project. <laughs> and uh, absolutely, here you can see the joint, and this will be, let's say, the twin on chip of a tissue that you have in a joint, how it will look like. And uh, what we will do is to include our sensor inside one different compartment, let's say, of this joint, of this tissue. So I show you before that by using our sensor now we can measure like forces of the or deformation, and now we can do because we can recap recapitulate in this small chip. Let's say have healthy and inflamed tissues. Okay, so by recapitulating this and measuring how this deformation, this parameter is changing, what we can do is to identify again a range of values that can indicate an healthy and inflamed conditions. So, and one of current of the problem of uh, rheumatoid arthritis is that you have different drugs that probably can work, but this is really specific. Some drugs can work for the patient and some not, and it takes a long time to test all the drugs. And then uh, why testing all the drugs, probably the patient enter already in a chronic disease and uh, it's too late. So now by using this chip, we can do like a 
track screening and see which one is working or even developing new one and see if this is even better. But now if you see if the drug is working or not, we need to identify parameter and see how this parameter is changing. And in our case, uh, we will use like the formation of forces as a parameter to monitor treatment uh, efficacy. So this is the way our bits will be used inside this chip. And what is the, at the moment, for example, one of the biggest challenge in this project for you? So the biggest problem, I mean, this is a huge project, probably uh, we are like 17 partners and uh, everyone has their own expertise and we are all building, let's say, this is like a Lego-like approach. You know, you have all the blocks and now is the time of the project where everyone builds the blocks and to put things together. So what I told you now is that we think that because we use also another project, we publish things on this piece that can be used in this direction, but we are not still sure. So now we really need to see when we will put our beads, if they are sensitive enough to distinguish or to measure this, and if not, probably we will need to change the properties. We know how to do it, to do it, but we will now is a time where we will integrate everything. Uh, and the initial idea needs to be proved. Okay. So to put it simply, um, to explain it in a si simple and short way, uh, what you are doing in Flamingo Project in general, all of you, all the all the partners, uh, you're trying to develop organ on chip that would enable also to conduct personalized clinical trials on chips instead of patients' bodies. So this way, serious side effects of some drugs could be avoided and the treatment could be speeded up, which is really good news for the patients. But could could this kind of chips, uh, um, organs on chips, uh, substitute animal testing in general? Because we know that in, for example, in the EU, EU uh, 10.5 million animals are used for research and testing and more than half of them mice most of them for finding and testing new medicine and these experiments are becoming less and less acceptable and are not always meaningful or effective um, is this miniature imitation of human organ on a chip the solution yeah i mean it's a good question it's also a really sensitive topic and you can see also that the sensitivity in this direction is changing and here there is like a recent law from FDA uh, in the USA, Modernization Act 2.0, that say that currently like uh, testing drugs on organ on chip can be used for approval to the FDA. So this means that are currently a sensitivity that is changing. But why is changing? Because I think also um, COVID time, uh, we, we learned something from, from there. Because at that time also now, you know, we have to develop new vaccine in a really like short terms. And we use technology that were there 10 years ago, it was nothing new. And there we need to be pretty fast to approve things that were already there. So now we need to see if we have an alternative uh, and this is a good alternative. We really need to do this now and not wait when there will be an emergency. And now about say, because you are probably more conservative and you say, okay, but if I don't test my drugs on an animal, you think that the animal is closer, let's say to a human, but this is not true because the gene expression, let's say gene profile that you have in a animal is completely different from human gene. And there's been proof, for example, that if you test the drugs that is working, let's say on an animal, 80% of the times fail when this is translated to human because you have completely gene inside the animal compared to human. Now inside this small lab on chip, what we can do is use cells from human and recapitulate specific functions. And in this way, now we can take like specific gene expression that are like similar to what you have in your body. And this is like providing already like there are companies. So the first, uh, uh, Organ on chip was published in 2008, was a lung on chip. So it's not new. And already there are like company, like uh, selling this organ on chip and there are pharma company that are using them to do their drug screen. So then if you're asking me, is this the future? I will tell you, this is the present. And what we need probably is to have like more 
of these tools and devices that can mimic specific disease, and in our case, will be art uh, rheumatoid arthritis. Mm -hmm. Great. So Flamingo is also um, playing a big part in this not future of medicine, but present, as you said. So thank okay. you very much, Salvatore, for, for this talk. Uh, we came to the end of our talk, and uh, I hope you enjoyed it, and I hope you have a lot of questions. Uh, so if anyone has a question, please uh, let us know. You can raise your hand or just uh, ask a question in the chat. Um, Thanks, Leah. It was really yeah, nice. <laughs> thank you. Yes, Sasha, please. Yeah, thank you. Uh, very nice presentation. Thank you very much, uh, Salvatore and Leah. Now I really understand the whole thing. <laughs> uh, but uh, what I couldn't understand was uh, how you force the cells through the tube with what force you use for the it's for slow. the cells to go through the the tube. So in our case, uh, we I can go back. Yeah, here is the video. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So in the, in this case, what we use, we just flow them. So when, uh, let's say, you flow an object in a channel uh, that has a size comparable to this object, we don't want that the cell touch. Because they, if they touch, they will just be compressed okay, mm -hmm. by the channel. In And we don't want this because if we want to do a base on this, we, then will be size dependent. Because some will be compressed and some not. So in our case, we want a free touch deformation. And this can be like uh, um, obtained just flowing fast an object in a small uh, in a small channel consider that the cells in this channel that is slightly bigger of a cell will flow at about 10 centimeters per second and then now uh, what we say there are like hydrodynamic force mm -hmm. that deform the cell mm -hmm. okay thank you Wait. Do you have any any other questions? Please raise your hands or just uh, write your question in the chat box. Uh, I'm going to ask one, uh, if nobody else will. Um, you mentioned that the the distribute the 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 shape and the, the 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 count of the cells changes between the healthy blood and the COVID nineteen blood. Yeah. Why does this this happen? Why do our our um, blood cells change because of the disease? I like this question because this brings me to the beginning. And uh, I mean, we measure the effect, but to know the cause, then now we will need to go more deep into biochemistry and understand, for example, how the gene profile is changing. Uh, if there are like, for example, specific receptor the change. Uh, so this is something that is under like investigation. I can tell you, for example, for long COVID, what they observed that are like some uh, a specific receptors that are activated on cell that are not only changing the shape, but they're bringing cells to create agglomerate. Okay. So now you can imagine one of the big problems why we are measuring the blood, because if the blood is not, if like cells are bigger, are stiffer or form agglomerate, this means uh, that cannot flow easily in your blood and reach organ to bring oxygen. And this can create in cascade a lot, a lot of problems. But is, this also brings a problem to your measurements because your the, 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 the small channel is in a size of a single cell, right? So mm -hmm. uh, as long as you have three or four cells together, you are in a... You're, no, you're the, reason... the thing is that... No, we don't. So now don't think that we want to get all deformed. The thing is that what we can do, and I show here, is that this is what we expect, or say, from let's say unhealthy. And then if I start measuring, you cannot see here, but if you would start seeing, we saw we call clots. Okay, clots it means agglomerate of cells. What you will see, you will see something start populating and appearing. So in this region, for example, 
that we not you will not expect. And what we can do also is that if we click on each point, so we get where is it like information now about what is there. So we can clearly see what is the problem there, that there is something different uh, that you don't have, that normally you should not have. So the, the thing is that for us uh, is to enable uh, an observation of, and see things that probably you will not observe because they are rare. If we can measure millions of cells, out of these millions, we can see sometimes hundreds that are like strange. I see. Thank you. Welcome. We have another question in the chat from uh, Stefano Lepor Leporati. Um, yeah. With your system, you will have a general overview of mechanical properties of cells, but you will lose a bit on a single cells. Is that right? Is asking Stefano. Uh, is this not true? Because again, uh, you will not lose because if I you know, we measure, but we are not providing just uh, each point here that we have is providing us a measurement on a single set. This is like really the strike of our technology and also microfluidics that is really unique. You can measure millions of cells and at the same time getting information at the single cell level. So I didn't show you here, but we have developed also like sorting technology. Because this is the good point. So here, for example, we see the cause. So we see that the cell is strange. Now, out of millions, we want to get out this cell, single one. We can do this. And by taking this out, then we can do more analysis and try to understand uh, from the biochemistry and mo molecular point of view what these cells as different compared to the others. I hope I reply to the question of Stefan. Yeah. Can I speak? Can you hear me? Yeah, please. Ah, sorry. So I, I'm from uh, CNR Nanotech and I'm I, I also doing some uh, in the past experiment on IFM. So the, exactly the, uh, the, the complementary of your technique. So I, I'm very excited. So very, very, very good talk. I, I, I appreciate a lot. Uh, that's why it was my question actually. Because yeah. uh, we are we are we are struggling on on a single one and uh, also on the statistics you can imagine you, we we cannot compare with yours so we need yeah. uh, but uh, now the technique are are a little bit improved also in the terms of uh, let's say of speeding up and uh, whatever yeah. but not that uh, as much as you you will be able to manage yeah. with your techniques so yeah. uh, very interesting uh, i mean i, I learned a uh, lot thank you very much I, for your oh, welcome i can also tell you uh, stefan this is really important now it doesn't mean that all the technology that were there before uh, are meaningful so they still uh, we still need this uh, from the research point yeah. of view and why because there is another things that I didn't tell you now but it's time scale Okay, oh, yeah. scale matters. And uh, because now when you want to investigate, in our case, we are pretty fast. And what we are getting probably is the reply of the cytoskeleton of the cells. And if you want to see like how each compartment of the cells behave under different forces, still, I mean, atomic force microscopy is still the standard, but this cannot go, let's say, can cannot be translated. As I show you here, it's like 10, 100 cells per hour, too far. No, no, from, from the yeah. point of view of, of the time scale, I mean, of, from from the statistics, you are right. But uh, um, I have developed a, a combined instrument with fluorescence and IFM and confocal, and I will try to do the same. And we, we will be able maybe to investigate uh, in the compartment. So yeah. that's, 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 the, that's yeah. the complementary of your technique that you will have... Yeah. Uh, let's say a, an average of all and a, a, even a, a measuring a single one but we will lose um, uh, information on inside of a single exactly. cell actually yeah. so that, that's that's the point so i i and now i i, I understand yeah. the, the the correct uh, the correct things yes thank you thank you very yeah. much do we have any more questions No, everything 
is clear. Salvatore, I guess you explained everything. Uh, and I'm sure that if someone has a question for you, uh, he, she can also write you an email. Yeah, uh, yeah. But at this point, I would like to, to thank you for this uh, interesting, uh, great talk. And thanks to everyone who, oh, we're not done yet. We have another question. Uh, yeah. I was too fast. So Alessandro, uh, how do you perform post-processing screening of the compression of beats? Do you have any in-home software? The compression? Yeah, I mean, uh, this is like a more mathematical problem. Uh, here, I show you like this, uh, this equation that is really simple, but it's not the case because the so you will have more forces. So then the shape that will be not like from spherical to elliptical. But what we can do is like it's called fine element analysis, where you can see uh, you can calculate this called the three different uh, principal component of forces that are acting uh, on these like uh, beads, and out of this you can measure uh, you can take out also the forces. We have done so. I show you this video here, and uh, I mean if you're interested, I also suggest you to read our paper that was published. Uh, where is it? Wait. Yeah, here in 2019. Now, uh, from here, we we like we're able to extract forces, yeah, and measure forces. My microphone. Yeah, microphone. Yeah. Thank you. So, Alex Alessandro is saying thank you. Uh, um, is anyone else who wants to pose a question before I say goodbye again? I, I can say uh, once more, and uh, I mean, the, the limitation, uh, ca can you follow some uh, time variation of, of some yes. mechanism? So yeah. that's, that's, a, that's a very in interesting thing, I think. Yeah. So here we are really like, uh, I, I don't have now in this presentation the data, but I mean, if you read the, this publication, you will see that we can measure over time. So this the, the idea was in this case to see how like uh, pathological changes that can happen, let's say in uh, embryo development can be correlated with this deformation uh, and also put more beads to see how like different parts of organs and tissue measure forces. This is the first time you can really like have a value for forces uh, in a living organism at the cell scale level. Yeah, that, that's very impressive, this, this measurement on zebrafish. So very impressive, very good, very good result. I'm impressed. <laughs> By the way, I study also in Germany, so at the Max Planck as well. So yeah, I'm a former colleague, maybe I, I'm not very young, but uh, maybe I don't know not you. Young as well. <laughs> yeah, maybe maybe we are in the same age. I don't know. Maybe not. Anyway, yeah. very nice talk. I appreciate a lot. Thanks, Stefan. Any more questions? Any last question? Okay. So. So thank you, Salvatore, again, for this great talk. And thank you to everyone uh, for, for joining us. Uh, and I wish you a, a pleasant evening. Thank you and bye.